Okay, let's put some the damn only drink in a tub with waterproof ink and steaming hot drink. He would write till he needed some grub. When he bathed in red wine, he wrote words of rhyme and sent them to ladies of fame. But these ladies of note forgot what he wrote and couldn't remember his name. When he bathed in hot tea, he wrote mystery and sent them to New Scotland Yard. But these words of intrigue were hard to believe and they sued him for dubious yarns. When he bathed in cow's milk, his words were like silk and he sent them to men of the cloth. But these gossamer notes were fed to the goats and they all developed a cough. <laughs> when he bathed in neat gin, he wrote with a grin and sent them to jesters and clowns. But these voluble puns were easy to shun for not one could vanquish a frown. <coughs> when he bathed in pea soup, his words were astute and he sent them to those of sharp wit. But these words for the wise were quickly despised, being seen as the work of a twit. <laughs> One day in his tub he started to blub, for all of his writings were spurned. His friends <coughs> said, your writings we dread. It would be best if they all should be burned. So this author in vain then boarded a plane and flew to a land far away. But in this new land, his writing seemed grand. Three cheers for the U.S. of A. Damn. You won't mind if I use this chair, do you? It's a little farther back. I'm going to bring it up. Wall is always moving the chairs, you know. That's better. What's I've got to be able to see you. My health is not what it was, but I do feel a little invigorated today, so I'm very glad of your company. A little while ago, I had a heart attack, and I was very convinced at the time that I was about to enter in, as they say. But as you can see, my entrance was postponed. I can't help feeling that it was rather a pity I did survive. I mean, having glided so painlessly up to the gate, to have it shut in one's face seems a little hard. <laughs> Especially knowing that someday the whole process must be gone through again, and perhaps a little less pleasantly. Though they call Stephen the first martyr, I sometimes think that Lazarus had the raw deal. Now, you won't mind if I indulge in a cup of tea, will you? I find that tea keeps me going. I feel a little bad because I'd hoped Warney would be here to make you a cup of tea. Before we got started, unfortunately, he had to pop out quite suddenly. I say suddenly, his departure seemed to coincide with the arrival of your bus. <laughs> but hopefully, if he gets back, we'll rustle you up a cup of tea and uh, we'll send you on your way rejoicing, won't we? You Americans drink iced tea, don't you? How strange. <laughs> I suppose that dates back to your first big tea party. <laughs> you dumped it in cold water then and you've been doing it ever since. <laughs> By the way... Stupid! Professor Tolkien tells me that he very much enjoyed his luncheon with you. Said it was one of the highlights of his calendar year. Well done. Professor is not an easy man to impress, I should know. Don't get me wrong, we have been friends for many, many years now. If, indeed, he and I, along with a few other writers, used to meet quite regularly. Men splendid among men, as Charles used to say. We called our little band The Inklings, and our chief occupation was to read to one another manuscripts that were works in progress. If I'm not mistaken, Tollers, that's what the professor is called in the inner sanctum, Tollers read the whole of The Lord of the Rings to us long before it was ever published. What a book. And its mounting levels of grandeur and terror, I judged it almost unequal in the whole range of 
narrative art. A man's fertility of imagination never ceases to amaze me. I, I remember one day. I was working on a manuscript that I was particularly keen to read to Tollers. I was feeling unusually positive about it. And I think that should have been the first warning sign. After I'd read the first few chapters, there was a stony silence, and Tollers was sat there rubbing his chin. Jackie, sir, I dislike it intensely. It really won't do, you know. Why don't you put your efforts into something more worthwhile? Professor's not a man to mince words. Well, after such stinging censure, I shelved the project to get on to something more worthwhile. Sometimes later, I was going through some old papers. You're all writers, aren't you? Do you tend to find that you accumulate papers? <laughs> I do. <laughs> and then the pile builds up to the point where I can't find anything I really want to find. Well, I've managed to solve this problem. You see, we never have enough paper to light our fires within the winter. So every now and then I go through this pop pile and pull out obsolete papers and I pull out uh, half-finished manuscripts that I'm not going to complete or Tollers doesn't want me to complete and then I throw them in the fire paper basket. Indeed when I have a book published I usually do exactly the same with the original manuscript. Charles rather scurrilously says that I should save these manuscripts for posterity, to which I reply that posterity has been blamed for far too many things already. Anyway, in this particular clear-out session, I came across the manuscript that Tollers had so roundly condemned, and I was just about to throw it away, and I thought, well, I'll give it a read. I can't do any harm. Ah, oh, fucked up. Do you know I was enthralled? <laughs> even though I'd written it myself. So I thought I'm going to finish it, Man, even though I will up. probably incur the wrath of my illustrious colleague. And that's exactly what I did. I sent it to my publisher, and he was so enthusiastic, he rushed it to the presses. And I'm very glad to say that 13 years later, Man, that's The Lion, The Witch, ass. and The Wardrobe is still in print. <laughs> now, it is my usual custom when I have a book published, to send a first edition copy to Tollers. <laughs> but I decided not to do it this time. I didn't want him to think that I was making a point, so you won't find it on his bookshelves, I don't think, nor, for that matter, will you find it on the bookshelves of many of my illustrious damn this colleagues. I think they regard my children's books as a betrayal of my position as an Oxford Don. I'm quite sure they regard my Christian books as a betrayal of my position as an Oxford intellectual. Not that I consider myself an intellectual. My wife was a little more blunt. Jack, she once said, the way you and your Oxford cronies sometimes pontificate, anyone would think that if you were all drowned at sea, the world would grind to a halt. Personally, my sympathies would be with the fish. <laughs> I think when I accepted a professorship at Cambridge, there was a quiet jubilation amongst many of Oxford's elite. They thought I would be packing my bags and leaving town. But as I could easily communicate, com commute to Cambridge, I had absolutely no intention of leaving the so city I'd lived in or, or near for the last 30 years. So we didn't move. That fucking pissed And here we off. are, still at the kilns. I often wonder what will happen to it when Lorne and I are gone. Judging by the number of tourists in this town, probably be bought some of by it will be bought by some Americans, I should think. <laughs> well it'll serve them right. <laughs> when they move the bookcases, the walls will fall down. <laughs> by the way, I say we didn't move, we lived here. I'm, of course, referring to my brother and I. My wife died three years ago. It's funny, really. When we were very young, Warley and I used to spend a lot of time on our own. <laughs> now that the twilight years have rolled in, we find ourselves on our own again. 
And still, I might say, content with our own company. <laughs> I don't know whether I should let you into a little secret. Warnie would be horrified. <laughs> no. But as he's gone AWOL, he can hardly argue, argue the point, can he? I sometimes call him BPB. He sometimes calls me SPB. SPB stands for Small Piggy Bottom. <laughs> So I think you can deduce what BPB stands for. That's what our nurse Lizzie Endicott called us when we were young. Precisely what inspired her, her to so name us. I'm sure I can leave to your own fertile imaginations. <laughs> Suffice it to say, the tradition remains till this day. Oh, not in public, you understand. But hardly add to our reputation as if when I was with the bank manager, I asked him whether Big Piggy Bottom needed to sign the documents as well. <laughs> I'm sure some people would say it's childish. I think we see it as a celebration of a relationship. No doubt the practice will continue till the day we die. <laughs> I've told Warney that if he goes first, I know what I'm going to inscribe on his gravestone. Here lies Warney, brother dear, who couldn't say no to a glass of beer. Here lies Warney, soldier brave, who beat his brother to this grave. Here lies Warney, he'll ne'er be forgotten, not with a name like Big Piggy Bottom. <laughs> Warney and I were allies from the start. To our new house, our large house, just outside of Belfast. Oh! Seem more like a city than a house. If the story of Clive Staples Lewis is ever written, and God forbid the posterity should once again be so lumbered, I think this house would feature as a major character. I'm a product of long corridors, empty sunlit rooms, indoor upstairs silences, Attics to be explored in solitude and endless books. <laughs> I always had as much certainty of finding a new book in our house as a man has of finding a flesh, fresh blade of grass in a lush green meadow. <laughs> One day I was thumbing through a book of poetry by Longfellow and I came across these words. I heard a voice that cried, Boulder the Beautiful is dead. Dead. I had, I had never even heard of Boulder, yet these words brought on an extraordinary mystical feeling. A, a notion of great cold expanses of the sky. I couldn't say exactly what I felt, only that it was a sense of exhilarating joy, and the more I tried to recapture the initial sensation, the more it slipped away. I think as a child I was a very, I was very precocious. I once remember walking into my parents, I think I was only four years old at the time, and saying that I did not like Clive, much less did I like Staples, and that I would only answer to the name of Jaxie. And from that time on I was known as Jaxie Lewis, which was later modified to Jack. When I was six years old, Mother took Warney and I to France for a short holiday. Father didn't come. Father was a man married to daily routine, so holidays were anathema to him. Anyway, when we got back, I happened to bump, bump into Father in the living room. Oh, hello, Jack, he said. How do you like France? I said, well, I, I like it very much, Father, though I find I have a pretty... Stupid! Oh, really, you sir? moron! Why is that? I said, Father, if I knew that, it wouldn't be a prejudice, would it? <laughs> it's one of the first times I ever saw mm. speechless. Mother just burst into laughter. Mm. She had a laugh that could inspire a thousand laughs. Mother was our rock, our fortress, almost the sole architect of our humdrum happiness. So when she died with cancer, it was the end of my world. The long corridors became long, empty corridors. 
the empty sunlit rooms became rooms blackened by the heavy drapes that were drawn across the windows. The upstairs indoor silences gave way to the cheerless sounds of weeping and lifeless dialogue. And the attics to be explored in solitude became attics to cry in solitude. <laughs> Our rock had sunk into the sea like Atlantis. Our fortress had crumbled. You got damn bitches out of The me. laughter had been silenced. And I was ten years old. Not long after Mother died, I was forced to leave my beloved house. Oh, not because Father was selling it, but because I was being sent to boarding school in England. <laughs> Can you imagine the desolation of a ten-year-old boy who has been stripped of much of what he holds dear and then finds himself travelling to a foreign and foreboding land? Fortunately, Warney was with me. I remember that it was a very rough sea crossing. Warney was seasick. <laughs> Absurdly, I rather envied this achievement and spent the rest of the journey trying to replicate it myself. So and when I did manage it, it was a very poor affair. Apparently, I'm too. a very good sailor. <laughs> Our destination was a town me. 20 miles north of London, of which the principal establishment was Winard Boarding School, the school to which we were being sent. Now... Use your imaginations. It is September 1908, and there is a young boy standing at the classroom door. He is sweating and itching thanks to the thick, dark, woolly clothes he is wearing. He is being throttled by a highly starched white collar. His feet are already aching in unaccustomed boots, and he is wearing knickerbockers buttoned up to the knee. Worst of all is a bowler hat, apparently made of iron, which grips his head. Man, I fucked up. <laughs> that was me. And I remember thinking then that, that if prison uniforms were anything like this, then I would remain a bottle citizen for the rest of my life. <laughs> Man, how small stupid school, can this guy be? So <laughs> how stupid! Man, you could have taken him off war with your brother. The proprietor and the headmaster, we called him Oldie, and his brow beaten son. Yeah, you could have done this. You could have asked me up there. Came to be named Wee Wee, one can only surmise the in joke amongst the boarders was that when he was being dressed for his christening, his infant baptism, someone forgot to put his nappy on. I think you'd call it a diaper. And then when he was being held over the font and felt water on his head, it started the waterworks at the other end, and the vicar said the first thing that came into his mind. <laughs> oh, he lived in a solitude of power. Like the sea captains in the days of sail. And he reveled in cruelty. I have known Oldie and many times come into a room, stand there, and his eyes would go to and fro, ravenously looking for some poor soul to settle on. And then when he found somebody, he would say, Oh, there you are, Rez, you horrid little boy. If I don't feel too tired this afternoon, I shall give you a good drubbing. <laughs> Despite all this cruelty, we did surprisingly little work. I think there was only one good thing that befell me at Winard. It was there that I first began to seriously read my Bible and to pray. Intellectually, however, my time at Oldies was almost entirely wasted. Had the school not closed down and had I remained there for another two years, I think my fate as a scholar would have been sealed for good. But it was closed down after an investigation following an incident when a boy was viciously beaten by Oldie. Do you know? Not long after that, Oldie was certified insane. Hmm. Well, that from the by. tyranny of Winard, oh, I went not. for a short while to a preparatory school, and then off to Malvern College in England. Another boarding school where a different form of tyranny reigned, prefects, who lost no opportunity in venting their spite against the new boys. But despite all this, 
It was at Malvern that my education really began, and it was also at Malvern that I retreated from whatever belief I had in Christianity. <laughs> so little by little, with fluctuations I cannot now trace, I, I became an atheist, dropping my so-called faith with no real sense of loss, and I might say a good deal of relief. <laughs> of course, like so many atheists, I was living in a world of contradictions. I maintain that God did not exist, but I was very angry with him for not existing. <laughs> I want to remember another little ditty. It's a bit silly, but it does sum up my situation. I hope I can remember it one day. I'm going to get caught out. Some say there is a being, divine or otherwise, who made the sun, the moon, the 